Hi, I'm Scott. And I'm Jen. And we want to invite you and your family to come experience Christmas at Summit Park, December 22nd and 23rd. It's going to be a Christmas memory maker for you and your family from start to finish. That's right. We're going to have powerful live performances with some of your favorite Christmas songs. And we're going to have something extra special just for the kiddos called Christmas Adventure. It's a free event. It's going to be so much fun. We're going to have hot chocolate, kettle corn, and a Christmas cookie decorating station. We'll even have some special characters, thank you, that your kids are going to be sure to recognize. Some of our characters are going to make it extra memorable. So make sure you come out and experience it. Santa himself will be making an appearance. And all of our characters will be available to take pictures with you and your family after each service. For more information on our service times, go to our website, summitpartchurch.com. It's going to be so much fun. We can't wait to see you there. Park, how we doing, everybody? Good to see you today. Good to see you today. Thanks for coming out here. I want to take a minute before we jump into the message and direct your attention to the little ornament on your seat. If you would, take that out and uh, just take a minute, look at that. Um, I want to encourage you to be praying over this. This is the last week as we head into our Christmas at Summit Park program, and we are believing God to do something incredible next weekend that so many people will find and follow Jesus. You can hang this on your tree, or you can hang this somewhere that you can see it. I have this hanging on the little tilt uh, part of my car steering column, so every time I go to uh, start my car, it takes me a second because I have to move this out of the way, and, uh, and then I pray for the event, and then, and then I'm able to go where I need to go. I encourage you to be praying for this. God answers prayer. If you believe it, say, I do. I 100% do. I've seen God answer prayer. We're praying that God will use next weekend to help people. Be inviting people. Be reaching out to people. God's going to use this. Um, my family and I are praying over this every night for our part of our Advent devotional that we're doing. We have this hanging on our little Jesse tree, which has all these little devotional ornaments on it. And uh, I asked my son the other day, who's in kindergarten, to pray for the program. And so he started praying. He's like, I didn't coach him at all. I just said, hey, can you pray for this? And uh, so you never know what's going to happen when you encourage a little child to pray. But he starts praying. He goes, God, I just pray for mom and dad and for the Christmas thing that they're doing. And uh, God, I pray that nobody would laugh at them. <laughs> I just thought, that's such an interesting prayer request, right? <laughs> Only a kindergartner would be thinking about that. Um, so if it's not funny at all next week, it's because Titus prayed. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, uh, but God answers prayer. I want to encourage you to be praying. We're going to believe God to do something amazing. I, want to, I just want to tell you, it's going to be powerful. You will not be disappointed. It's going to be fun outside in the parking lot, but it is going to be powerful in here. The music is amazing. And the way that the story interweaves with some of the stuff that we're doing, you're going to love it. Invite your friends. You will not be disappointed. Um, we're wrapping up our series, our King Me series today. Obviously, you just saw the video the whole idea comes from checkers, if you're new. Uh, this whole idea comes from checkers. Checkers is a game of dominance. It's a game where you take your piece, you jump over someone else's piece, then you take their piece, then you get to the end, and you get another piece that looks just like yours, put on top of yours, which gives you more autonomy, more power, and you get to say the magic words. Everybody say it one more time with me, one final time as we wrap up this series. You get to say, king me, king me, yes. And king me, you get to go backwards and forwards, you get to do more, you get to be more in control. And what we're talking about in this series is a lot of times in our lives, we think this is what we're looking for. We think if I could just have more autonomy, more control, if I could just be uh, more in charge of my circumstances and situations, then I would be better off. And what we're learning is actually the opposite is the case. That when you and I take back control of our lives, we actually end up out of control. 
What we really want is what we're finding out in this series is we really want not to be in more control of our lives, but we want to give up control to the one who is ultimately in control, and his name is Jesus. That's what we're talking about in this series, and we're unpacking it, we're looking, and we're, the big idea is this, King Me isn't all that it's cracked up to be. In fact, tell one person next to you, just look them in the eye with a smile on your face and say, King Me isn't all that it's cracked up to be. King Me is not all that it's cracked up to be. What we want is not to be king, but to give up control to the king. And so we're unpacking this, and we're looking at the nation of Israel, because they basically show us what not to do. They, they, they've showed us that they go to God and they say, king me. They basically say this to the Lord. And God's like, no, 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 I want to be your king. I want to take care of you. I want to be your provider. I want to go before you. And they're like, no, 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 no. We want to be in, in control. We want to be king. King us. Give us a king. And so God ultimately gives them a king in his grace and his mercy. And we're watching how it's not a good situation. It starts good. God's trying to be good. But because human beings are failed and, uh, and flawed, that things don't go well for the nation of Israel. And so we're learning these little life lessons. And if you just joined us, I want to encourage you to go online. You can catch up, some up parkchurch.com. All of these messages are building on each other. But today, we're going to get, we're wrapping up, and we're going to be talking about what happens when the kingly dream that you have doesn't work out quite how you thought it would. Sometimes in life, we're going to have a dream that we thought, we're going to do this, and we take a sharp right turn, and we end up doing something completely different. How many of you have ever had a dream? You're like, this is what I'm going to do. It's going to be amazing, and I'm going here, and all of a sudden, you ended up way over here just as a symbol of failure. Let's just all raise our hands, everybody, because we've all been there. There's all been a moment where it's like, this didn't work out quite how I thought it would. I remember when I was 15, I had a dream. I had the dream car dream. You know what I'm talking about? When you're 15, I was, when I was 15, I got my permit like that day. I could not wait to drive. And I was so excited about it. And then I was looking forward to turning 16. And I didn't know, man, what, what was I going to get? What kind of car, you know? Maybe my dad will buy me a car. Maybe that would be amazing. What if he got me a car? That would be amazing. And you just have this dream car. And then you have like the dream dream car, which, of course, has always been the Porsche Carrera 911. <laughs> With the large wheels in the back. That's the dream, dream car. But I kind of had like the relative dream car. You know, like it could possibly happen. Like if dad just so wanted to make it happen. And, um, you know, if he just felt compelled, felt led of the spirit. I had a dream. And uh, the dream looked a little something like this. Come on, somebody. It looked like (laughs) the 93, 93 Mustang Celine, 350 pounds of torque, 5.0 liter V8 engine, Vortec bypass with 325 horsepower. (laughs) I had visions. I had dreams. I had dreams of cruising up and down Telegraph Road, just looking at people. Just, you want to race? You want to go? Let's go. Let's do this. I had people challenging. I had people, I I had dreams of people looking at me and saying, I like that guy. I want to be with that guy. I had dreams of being a chick magnet. I thought if I could just get it, man, it would all work out. I had dreams. But you know what my dream ended up looking like? Right here. (laughs) What you're looking at is an 88 Plymouth Voyager minivan. (laughs) My dad graciously gave me his work van (laughs) that was full of cleaning chemicals, and it didn't say chick magnet. It said, hide your kids, hide your wife. That's what it said. I ended up getting that taken away from me, from my dad, because I had a couple moving violations. (laughs) And... I ended up even moving backwards and ended up with this true story right here. (laughs) What you're looking at is an 81 Chevette. Did not come with a stereo system. I had to have a boom box in the back seat. 
and I would be driving, and I'd reach over, and I'd press play. <laughs> Four-cylinder that at its max produced is between 60 and 70 horsepower. Some lawnmowers have more. It didn't scream chick magnet either. It screamed, I'm not going very far, and I'm not going to get there very fast. Sometimes your dreams can take a right turn, and it work out nothing how you thought it would work out, and that's what happens for King David. King David is anointed king. God comes to him through the prophet Samuel and says, I'm going to make you the king. And he's anointed king at a, a very young age. And shortly thereafter, he takes on the giant, and we looked at this a couple weeks ago, Goliath. And he slays Goliath. And it's this great moment of victory. And then he goes on this war campaign with the king, and the king loves him and is high-fiving him. And they've got secret handshakes, and it's amazing. And he goes, and he has a great victory, and he's get, he gets made a general in the army. And they're coming back, and everything's great. And it's amazing until... The women come out, we looked at this last week, and they welcome the heroes home. And they're singing songs, and, and they're singing songs about King Saul. But they're singing better songs about King David. Saul gets jealous, starts using David for target practice, and things spiral downward. What began as this great kingly dream now is looking more like an 81 Chevette. And David is on the run. You, you find out that David is constantly on the run. He's constantly on the move. He's trying to get away from Saul. Saul is chasing him, and, and David lives, some scholars believe, the next 10 years of his life on the run. Not just from anybody, but from the king himself, who has an army, power, money. David has nothing, and he's on the run and from the point that David is anointed king to the point he becomes king, crowned king in Jerusalem, there is a, a gap of 22 years. 22 years from when he's anointed to the time he's actually crowned. He lives much of his life in the middle moment where he's anointed but not yet experienced the kingly dream that God has given him. How many of you know Many times, life is lived in those middle moments. Life is lived in those middle moments. In fact, maybe some of you have come in here today, and you are living in a middle moment. You had something, uh, you had big dreams. You felt like God spoke to you. You had big dreams about your marriage, big dreams about your career, big dreams about your family, and they do not look, what your current experience is, does not look like those kingly dreams. What do we do in those moments? What do we do with those middle mundane moments that look nothing like the dream that we have in our heart? David gives us a great little example of how to manage those middle moments. 1 Samuel chapter 22. This is a simple passage. In fact, when we read this, you're going to be like, seriously, that's where we're landing this series? I mean, there's nothing here, Scott. There's some amazing nuggets of gold found in these very simple verses because life oftentimes is lived in those simple mundane moments that are not looking like the dream. There's no dancing. There's no singing. There's no Goliath being slain. It's just normal mundane, and it looks like you're under attack. How do you manage that? Let's look. First Samuel chapter 22. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. David is on the run. Saul is chasing him. He finds this cave. Some people, uh, some places in Scripture will call this the stronghold. If you've read some verses, we'll call it the stronghold. This is basically a series of caves that was uh, elevated, and it was on the border of the Philistine nation. So it was close enough to the Philistines that Saul had to think twice about going there. This would have been a safe place. The, the caves, many of them had tunnels that David could get from one cave to another. This would be a great place for David to hide out if he was trying to run away from Saul. But David's there alone, but not for long. Look in the next verse. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. Maybe they thought he needed company, probably more so. They were afraid for their own lives. So they show up, and they start knocking on, on David's door here at the cave. 
Verse 2, all, other people show up. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented also gathered around him. And then he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. So he's got these people showing up. He's got his family showing up. And watch what David does in this mundane middle moment. He doesn't just sit there. He does something with it. Verse 3. From there, David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? So he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. Verse 5. But the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Hereth. Really inspiring scripture, isn't it? <laughs> There's not, he was like, this is very basic. He, he's there, he's, his family shows up. These, these other guys show up that don't seem very talented or gifted. Seem like they're on the run as well. David goes to Moab, and then he leaves after the prophet. What's going on here? There's amazing nuggets of gold wisdom in this. How to manage the middle moments. How to manage when you're in between the king dream that God has given you uh, and experiencing it in your life. A lot of middle moments. There's five action steps that I want to show that David does here that you and I can apply as we live in our middle moments. And what we're going to find is this. You can be mighty in the middle. You can be mighty when you're going through the middle. So will you turn to someone next to you with a smile on your face and with conviction and say, you can be mighty in the middle. Turn to someone and say, you can be mighty in the middle. Let me give you five action steps. The first one is this. Take care of the responsibilities that are in front of you. David takes care of his mom and his dad. Simple enough, right? That seems almost basic. It seems very plain. But there is significance in this. He goes to Moab, and he goes to the king of Moab. He says, would you let my father and mother stay there until I learn what God will do for me? He takes care of his parents. Let's just put this in context, right? David is on the run from the king, and his parents show up. Have you ever had someone show up when it just wasn't a good time? <laughs> Have you ever just like gone to the door, and you're like, are you serious? What are they doing here? Have you ever had your parents show up when it wasn't a good time? Don't raise your hand, especially if they're in here. But, you know, how many, like, sometimes it'd be like, oh, well, okay. Oh, and you get like, you have to act excited even if you're not, right? Hey, mom and dad, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Oh, son, you know, we thought we'd just stop by. We were in the neighborhood. We thought we'd just come stay with you a little bit. And David's like, um, great. Well, I don't know if you knew this, but the king is trying to kill me, and I've got a lot on my plate right now. I've got a lot that I'm trying to manage. David does not do that. What he does is he takes care of the responsibility that is in front of him. Let me just say this. This is a great little principle for us. One of the best things we can do is give ourselves to the tasks that are in front of us. One of the things that you and I can do when we're on the run, when we feel like we're on, under attack, when we feel like it's not working how we thought it was supposed to work out, we can give ourselves to the task that God has put in front of us. Part of your understanding, Jesus as king, is understanding that although he may have called you to something down the road, what he has for you is right now what is in front of you. That's, that's what we give ourselves. Part of understanding Jesus as king is being faithful with that mundane moment that's right in front of you right now. You don't think much of it. It's not a big deal, just managing mom and dad. No, this is God's will for David's life. This is what God has for him. And this was nothing new for David. David lived this. He was a shepherd, right? In fact, when his brothers were, were out, like they were getting ready to fight, and they were like the warriors, and who wouldn't want to be there with them? David's father was like, I want you tending sheep. I want you out there. I want you running errands. Take bread. These little mundane roles. What's David learning when he's out there tending sheep? He's called to be king, 
But all he's doing is tending animals. But you know what? He's actually going to be learning some very important lessons while he's tending these sheep. What better practice to care for people than to care for a flock of sheep? What better practice to care for a nation than to care for a few animals? That's exactly what, you know what just happened? It's karate kid moment right here, right? It's wax on, wax off. It's paint the fence. Well, you never seen karate kid? (laughs) He's learning some great valuable moments. What to do, where to go, how to be. Oh, by the way, while he's out there, he's learning how to use a slingshot. That's going to come in handy when he faces Goliath, right? Oh, by the way, he's also learning how to pray. He's writing amazing psalms, and he's having this great interaction with God, all while he's seemingly doing the mundane. God is actually preparing him for the miraculous. See, sometimes in our life, what can happen, if we're not careful, is God will speak something to us, and we'll get distracted by our destiny. We'll be so consumed about where we're going that we'll miss where we are right now. Sometimes we need to realize that God's will for us is to be faithful with the moment, as mundane as it might be, that is in front of us right here and right now. David one day will be king, but you know what he is right now? A brother and a son. And he's giving himself to that task. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with doing that. There's everything right with being faithful with what the Lord has in front of you. So let me just throw this out there. So if you're a student in here at any level, if you're in, in junior high or high school or college, and you're a student, then let me encourage you. Know this. One of your primary jobs, one of your God-honoring uh, moments is to give yourself fully to your studies. I know you don't want to hear that. You're like, heretic. It's true. You can honor God by the way you do your schoolwork. You can honor God by the way you go about that mundane uh, moment of managing your schoolwork. If you're a son or a daughter, then one of your primary tasks, if you're young, is to listen to your parents. It's one of your primary jobs. And again, you're like, heretic. You don't want to hear that, but that's true. As you get older, if you're a son or a daughter, then one of your primary jobs, one of my primary jobs, is to take care of my parents. If you're a parent, then one of your primary jobs from God for you is to take care of your kids. Moms, you're like, no, but I'm called to do things. I'm called to speak. I'm called to write books. I'm called to change the world. And you might be, but it's going to start with you changing some diapers. Come on, somebody. (laughs) That's what it's going to look like. Dads, you got kingly dreams. God's got this big dream for you, this big vision. You're going places. You know what one of your primary jobs is? Is to take care of your kids spiritually to lead them, to invest in them, to pray with them, to pray for them, to teach them about God. Well, I don't know about God. Learn about God. And then teach your kids about him. It's your primary job. Don't be distracted by your destiny that you miss out on the mundane moment that God wants to do a miracle through now and prepare you for a miracle later. So one of the first things that David does is take care of the responsibility that's in front of him. Second, David teaches us this, don't cover up your story, embrace it, and let God use it. Don't cover up your story, but embrace it and let God use it. What's interesting is that David goes to the Moabite king, and he says, hey, can you watch over my parents? It's so interesting that David goes to the king of Moab. No, you wouldn't want to go to the king of Moab. Moab is, was like, they were this thing. They were relatives of Israel, but they were kind of like relatives you didn't want to talk about. Like, they were like the bad relatives. Where the Moabites came from is, is Abraham. You remember Father Abraham? You remember how he had many sons? Do you remember how many sons had Father Abraham? Do you remember how you were one of them and so am I? I messed that up. Cool. It's been a while. 
Well, let's just praise the Lord. Do you remember that? That's Father Abraham. He has a nephew named Lot who is a hot mess. He continues to choose the wrong thing over and over and over again. He chooses wickedness. He chooses to be by wickedness. His wife chooses wickedness. It ends up killing her. His daughters choose wickedness. They get him drunk, sleep with him so they can have kids. These descendants of those kids, those are the Moabites. So these are the relatives you don't talk about from the crazy uncle no one wants to uh, affiliate with. No one wants to talk about being a Moabite. Have, having Moabite in your blood would be something you wouldn't want to brag about. It would be like being a Cowboys fan. If you were a Cowboys fan, you just you wouldn't brag about that. It's unfortunate you wouldn't brag about it. But you know who has Moabite in his blood? David. David has a great-grandmother named Ruth. Ruth the Moabitess. He's actually related to this section of humanity that they don't want to affiliate with. He's related to it. And it would be easy for him not to want to associate that. To want to cover that up as soon as it's brought up in a conversation. But instead of ignoring it, he embraces it and he allows God to use it. He goes to the king of Moab and says, can you look after my parents? Here's what's amazing. David's not so great background is the very thing God uses to save his family. Here's the truth. Sometimes your messed up background is the very thing that God can use to bring someone else salvation. Something you don't want to, you don't want to talk about. You don't want to emphasize. You want to pretend. You want to show up to church and it's all cute and pretty and just appropriate and everyone's well behaved and we smile and we lift our hands on the third song just right. But you know what? When we do that, we're not real. We're not, we don't experience real healing if we're not real. And we can't bring real healing if we're not real. And what the world needs is for us not to act like everything's perfect in our life, but to open up our heart to the God of the universe who created us and wants to do something in us for real and then let people see that. Be like, oh, you know what? I used to struggle with that. Let me help you. Let me encourage you. Or I'm actually struggling with that. Can you pray for me? Can we encourage each other? Sometimes our Jacked up background is the very thing God will use to help other people find and follow Jesus. So don't ignore it. Don't run from it. Embrace it and let God use it. Some of you have a story to tell. Some of you have a testimony. Don't be ashamed of it. Let God use it and bring glory to him. And and let your light shine. Encourage people with it. And God will use you in a powerful way. David teaches us not to cover up our story, but to embrace it, and to let God use it. Third thing is this. Do good to as many people as you possibly can. Do good to as many people as you possibly can. One of the things you and I can do when we're in trouble, one of the best things you and I can do when we are in trouble is to help someone else who is also in trouble. David's in trouble here, isn't he? And who shows up at his doorstep? People who are in more trouble than he is. Look at verse 2. All those who are in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. Now, if you're in trouble and you're trying to figure out stuff, this isn't like the who's who list of people you want around you. You know what I'm saying? Like, David's got to be thinking, God, will you just send me some winners? God, will you send me, like, some amazing, mighty warriors, people who will help me? And then all of a sudden, his family shows up. He's got to manage that. And then all these other people show up, and he's looking at him. He's walking him, come up. He's like, man, discontented, distressed, and in debt. God, um, I don't know. These kind of look like losers. I think you're sending me the wrong people. <laughs> and then they come forward, and he's like, he gets them all together. and Guys, I really appreciate everybody coming out here, and thank you for your concern. But um, I don't know if you guys know this, but um, you're losers. And I'm losing right now. It's not a good combination. 
We don't need to, what, I, what I really need is people who are winning. Have you ever felt like that in, in a moment? Have you ever processed that? Have you ever shown up to life group and saw a few people and you're like, oh, no, Jesus. No, 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 no. We are not doing this. Or you show up for your ministry position, and someone comes up, and you're just like, whoa. Like, I don't know if we want you on the front door. Oh, oh. You ever had that thought? David doesn't do that. David doesn't do that. In fact, he embraces those that are in distress. And you know what? He gives us the heart of the ultimate son of David, doesn't he? He gives us just a glimpse of the heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus is that those who are broken, those that are hurting, those that are disenfranchised, those that don't have a place, those that are in debt, distressed, and discontented are welcome here. That's the heart of God. That's the church. That's who we're supposed to be. That's the heart of Jesus, and that's exactly what David does. He says, oh, come on here. Come on home. Welcome home. Yeah, you're messed up. I'm messed up. This is the church. And something great happens here. You know what ends up happening with these guys? Those who are in debt and distressed and discontented, you'll read later that David fights battles after becoming king, and he has a group around him that are called the mighty men. Do you know where they came from? This group of those that are distressed and discontented and in debt. God makes warriors out of those that would be looked at as losers. That's who he is. That's what he does. That's the message of Jesus. And sometimes, you know what, we need to look at people and say, you know what, I'm not looking at what you can bring to me. I'm looking at what I can bring to you. You might be struggling. Let me help you. Let me encourage you. And you know what, you might actually walk away I'm feeling a little bit better because Proverbs 11 says this, a generous person will prosper and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Listen, you will reap what you sow. You want friends? Be a friend. You need help? Give help. And God will take care of you. That's just how it works. It's a spiritual principle. God will take care of you when you take care of those who need taking care of. I love what John Wesley says, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Great heart for the church, great mission mission for the church. This is the heart of Christ. You're broken, let me help you, let me encourage you. David does this. Even in the midst of his own issues, he's willing to help those who have issues. Fourth, seek the Lord for the decisions you have in front of you. Seek God for the decisions you have in front of you. Some of you are like thinking back to that verse. You're like, I don't remember David praying in that verse. There was nothing, there was no mention of prayer. There's no mention in that verse, but we know that David prayed while he was in the cave. Psalm 142, look at this. A mascal of David when he was in the cave. A prayer. Better than just telling us that he prayed, the Bible gives us his prayer. I love it. Watch this. It says, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. What do you think his complaint was? God, my family just showed up. What am I supposed to do with them? And God, these losers, look at them. They smell too. But I tell him my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. Where does he go? Does he complain about it? Does he just whine about it? Does he get discouraged? No. He drills down deep and he goes to God. What a clinic on how to handle your middle moment. Go to God with it. Seek the Lord with it. When my spirit goes faint, you watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Look and see. There's no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. He's like, I have to care for everybody else. But nobody cares for me. Nobody's looking out for me. But you know who doesn't hear this? The men don't hear this. The family doesn't hear this. Only God hears this. This is really good. You go to God with your need. You go to God with your problems. 
And all of a sudden, watch this, verse 5. He starts to change even in the middle of his prayer. He says, I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge. No, he just said, I have no refuge. But no, he's going to God. And you know what happens when you go to God? Your heart begins to change. And you realize what you have through prayer. He says, no, I, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me. Who's pursuing him? The king. For they are too strong for me. No kidding. Full army coming after you. But they're not stronger than God. And he goes to God. He says, set me free from my prison that I might praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. He goes to God. You'll see this again and again and again in David's life. Just a few verses later, they're not sure where to, if they should go down and fight the Philistines. And, and David goes, God, should I go? And, David's, and God's like, yeah, go. And then the men are like, no, 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 we shouldn't do that. And David goes again to God, God, should I go? And God's like, yeah, you should go. And David goes. He seeks the Lord again and again and again and again and again. When you're in the middle moment, the best thing you can do is seek the Lord. God, what do you have for me? I want you involved with this. God, I don't like this. But God, my hope is in you. This is the heart of King Me. It's the heart of this whole series. It's saying, God, you're God, I'm not. And I'm going to trust you. I'm going to look to you. And I'm going to believe what you say. And the last very important lesson that we, that we learn from this is this. When God asks you to do something that doesn't make sense, do it. And the worship team can come. When God, doesn't, when God asks you to do something that doesn't make sense, do it. David seeks God's direction. He asks for God's input and insight. And then God speaks, and then David does it. Watch this. But the prophet Gad said to David. So when the prophet speaks, he's, be, he's speaking on behalf of God. He says, do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Harith. Okay, think about this for a moment. The stronghold, the cave of Adullam, is a well-fortified position. It's a cave with elevation, with escape tunnels. If you want to be anywhere, you want to be here if you're trying to fight off an attack. And God goes, no, I want you to leave that place, and I want you to go to the forest. Wide open, exposed in the land of Judah. Judah. Does this make any sense in the natural? Nope, it doesn't. Do you know this? If you walk with God at all, he's going to get you to do something that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense uh, to you in the natural. It doesn't make sense to help people when you need help. It doesn't make sense to give generously when you want to be stingy. It doesn't make sense to give up your time. It doesn't make sense to trust God. It doesn't make sense. But it's the best place for us when we know that God is speaking to us to go against what we might feel, but what we are knowing is right by him. We say, I'm going to trust you. When God asks you to do something that doesn't make sense, trust him. Lean into it. Experience it. We know this. David does this. He trusts God. And because he trusts God, he's always one step ahead of Saul. He's one step ahead of him. Almost, like, magically. How many know it's not magic? It's a miracle. It's because God is working in his life. He's always one step ahead of Saul. Saul, Saul shows up, David's already gone. Why? Because he's seeking God, and God is leading him, even when it doesn't make sense. I want to encourage you. There might be something that God is encouraging you to do, something that God is wanting you to give up or something God is wanting you to start in your life. You will not regret one moment when you respond to what God is speaking to your heart. You will always regret it when you don't. And this is a great spot for us to land on this series because this is the point of the series. God, I'm not in control of this thing. I'm not going to be, but I am going to trust your control. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you even when I can't see it, even when it doesn't make sense.